Welcome to Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes. Joyous conversations about what the afterlife evidence and modern science combine to tell us is true about our one reality. You have nothing to fear. You are eternal and you are perfectly loved. Knowing the truth changes everything. Now, here's Roberta. Welcome to Seek Reality. I'm Roberta Grimes and I'm so happy you're with us today. Our guest today is a longtime scholar of spiritually transformative experiences, which are otherwise known as STEs, who has been in this field really since its beginning, even though he looks very young. This is John R. Audet's fifth Seek Reality appearance. We have to mention the fact that his first two appearances were in Seek Reality's first year, and now we're beginning our 11th year, even though we look very young, too. John's career history has been in medical and hospice administration, which is where he first met his per, the fields. He met the pioneers, let's put it that way, like Dr. Raymond Moody. And he met him even before Dr. Moody wrote Life After Life, which was a long time ago. John also was honored to know some of the great afterlife pioneers like Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, for example. He is the great Principal founder of the International Association for Near-Death Studies, or IANS, which is the main, of course, the main um, uh, group in this field nowadays. John Audet is a native of South Florida, where he still resides, and his professional career has spanned more than three decades of senior executive positions in hospital and hospice administration and physician practice management, as well as the performing arts and public broadcasting. I think he's a dancer on the stage. I don't know what that's all about. But John originally earned a BA degree in history and sociology from Augusta College and an MS degree in sociology from Virginia Tech. More recently, he's contributed chapters about spiritually transformative experiences and non-local consciousness to some scholarly books. He's very serious about it now, and he serves as president and CEO of Eternia, which he co-founded with Dr. Eben Alexander and the late Dr. Edgar Mitchell, who was, remember the Apollo 14 astronaut who was the sixth man to walk on the moon? John R. Audet has written his own book, too, on spiritually transformative experiences and what we can learn from them. It's called Loved by the Light, True Stories of Divine Intervention and Providence. It's now available on Amazon. He is a a fount of information, frankly, and he's really a a delight to know. So, John, welcome. It's lovely to have you with us today. Thank you, Roberta. It's great to see you again and nice to be with you. I always love to hear more of your stories about the early days when no one knew or even, I think, suspected how prominent this field was going to be someday. I mean, I was just way back then, I was just a researcher. I I had to know what this was all about because I had my own STE when I was a child. In fact, I had two. I had one when I was 20 as well. And I thought I was just researching this for myself. I never dreamed it was going to become, you know, one of my major pursuits in life. And so the, tell, let's talk about it. Let's let's talk about how it became kind of a major part of your life, too. Well, great question. Um, and I have to say that it began in 1960 uh, for me at the age of eight years, uh, just eight years old, third grade. It years for me too. So wow. think about that. Oh. Yes. Well, oh, there's a there's a coinka dink for you. Uh, so my friend, one of my best friends at the time, was Mike Waters, and we were walking home from school one day, and Mike was rather depressed and not his usual cheerful self. And I asked what was wrong, and he, he told me it was his mom. And I was aware that his mother suffered a near fatal heart attack, and had been rushed to the hospital where she was basically clinically dead, and they revived her. And uh, she had come home, I think, two or three weeks later, and I was going to see her that afternoon for the first time since she had been hospitalized. So I said, well, what's wrong with your mom? I thought she was all better. They released her from the hospital, so what's going on? Why are you sad? He said, well, I want my old mom back. (laughs) He said, the... The she's changed, you know. I said, "Well, how has she changed?" Well, you'll see. You're gonna you're gonna see her. He said, she, she, "She's like all she wants to talk about now is God, heaven, 
Jesus and the angels. And I said, <laughs> really? Yeah. She said she went to heaven and met God and Jesus and saw angels. And she just talks about how much God loves us, you know, and I want my old mom back. The new, my new mom is a Jesus freak. So oh, I, I saw her that afternoon you know, at the end of the walk We went for the proverbial milk and cookies, which was our routine. And there she was, and oh boy, he was right. I I could see that I could really see the change physically. She was all aglow. I mean, she had I don't see auras, but she clearly had this beautiful uh, halo around her, like a yellowish golden halo. Uh, and she was just full of um, enthusiasm. I mean, she was as cheerful and enthusiastic as one gets. Um, and so it's so good to see you, Mrs. Waters. I'm glad you're back from the hospital, and I'm glad you're feeling better. Oh, yes, honey, I'm just fine. I'm just <laughs> fine. You know, and I wouldn't be but for the grace of God. You know, great God's love uh, brought me back to life, and here I am. And, you know, don't you ever doubt God is real. Uh, and so are the angels, and so is heaven. And I said, well, I got to go out in the backyard and play now with Mike. He's waiting for me. So I left, you know, but I will never forget that encounter with her. And it stayed on my mind as an impression that wouldn't ever uh, diminish. So my first um, quarter as a full-time student at Augusta College was 1974. I'd been discharged from the Army around that time. And I was fortunate to be elected president of the sociology club. And uh, I did first meeting, I asked fellow club members if they could suggest any interesting speakers we could bring to campus. And only one person raised her hand, and that was Kathy Tabakian, who's acknowledged in Raymond's book, Life After Life, um, that came out in the fall of 1975. And Kathy said, my next door neighbor, Dr. Raymond Moody, would be perfect. He's very entertaining. Um, and I said, well, what's his doctorate in? And she said, philosophy. And I said, well, what, what would he talk about, Plato? And she said, no, 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 he loves Plato. And he'll talk about Plato if you want him to. But no, he, he's been doing this really interesting research at the Medical College of Georgia, where he's a medical student, concerning people who uh, were clinically dead and resuscitated to come back and tell their stories. You know, what kind of stories? Well, you know, like leaving their body and going off to heaven and meeting Jesus and God and the angels. And of course, as soon as she said that, yeah. the memory from third grade came rushing up to the forefront of my consciousness. And I said, Kathy, I must meet this man. The ring of destiny. I, I heard it loud and clear. First time and only time in my life. And we met the next day. I, she took me over to meet Raymond the next day. And it was uh, love at first sight. And, you know, Raymond... Uh, was the first one, well, he was the first one to do a lot of things, but he came up with the term near-death experience. And uh, he loved the whole subject of historical perspectives on near-death experiences. He would talk about going back to Plato uh, and even further. Um, one story I learned from him was about uh, Blaise Pascal, uh, who is a French mathematician, uh, in 1654, he had an STE. And in about, I think it was about 15, 20 years after that, he wrote a book uh, called Think. Um, and it was about his STE, but also his musings about God. And he said something very profound for 1670s, I think, which is when this book came out. He said he thought... Humanity suffered from one problem, which was uh, a God-shaped hole, a void yes. uh, within each psyche. Yeah. And he said the God-shaped hole can only be filled by God. Um, right. So in order for people to truly know joy and uh, to be able to whether the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune in life, they needed to have a relationship with God, as he did because of his STE. 
as Mrs. Waters did because of her STE. By the way, today is June 25th, and in, a four, in four short days, Dr. Raymond Moody turns 80 years of age. And I just want to wish him a happy birthday. And <laughs> everybody who's watching should do the same. Um, you know, please do, because Raymond... Uh, he's a little Buddha, you know, he, he's got the, the best sense of humor. He's a great storyteller and he's contributed so much um, to this field and, and I would say other fields too. So happy birthday, Raymond, and may you live uh, well past 100 because we need you. Um, nobody Those who are first hearing this, um, it's three weeks later because we always film these three weeks ahead in order yeah. for Roberta not to go crazy worrying about are we going to have this available on time. So that's that's why you're looking at your calendar in confusion. But yes, we yeah. will wish him a somewhat belated birthday. Yes. Oh, okay. I see you're right. Yes, correct. Happy birthday, Raymond. So um, just back to the God-shaped hole. Yes, it's a, everyone it's a, has. Yes. It's a profound concept. It you know, is. Yes, it is. That's why that's such a famous quotation. I often say, and I think I think there's some physiological basis to it. Yeah. Uh, he never pinpointed the location of the God-shaped hole, but I think most people are aware of it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's a yearning, it's a hunger, a thirst to connect with something beyond yourself, something greater to oneself. And, um, you know, I often say in my uh, presentations that there are really only two ways to live one's life. The first is uh, to believe or to know that everything you do, every earthly action, has some transcendent consequences and meaning. Uh, the other way, of course, is the opposite, that you're living your life just for this one single solitary lifetime and nothing comes after. Um, and depending upon how you answer that question for yourself, which is fundamental, uh, so too is your worldview or your philosophy of life. It all comes down to um, why am I here and who am I? And if you have a relationship with God and you know that God is real, I don't mean on the basis of faith. I mean on the basis of data, evidence. You know, study how an acorn emerges into an oak tree. Every stem, every branch, every leaf, every root, every piece of bark comes in that little acorn. How does that happen? <laughs> you know, uh, galaxies emerge from stardust. The Milky Way once was particles of stardust. How does that happen? How does union of sperm and egg, the zygote, emerge into somebody like Beethoven? You know, every single piece of music he ever composed is in that zygote. I mean, the potential is incredible. And how does that happen? Does that happen by accident? I mean, I don't think so. But, you know, if one looks objectively at um, the whole question of God. I mean, put religion aside, because I think religion has a lot of, done a lot of damage to God um, by miscasting God. Um, I My personal belief is that God is pure, perfect love and cannot be... Of course be it is. But the yeah. thing is that, that, just to finish your thought, which I think was a brilliant thing for you to bring up, that God-shaped hole is one which human beings have tried to fill with religions. Yes, which was which was beside the point. Religions are not God; they're human made. They're always human made. But that was that that was that human effort to try to fill that hole. Yes, correct. And I'm not saying religion hasn't done some good, um, but I think religions across the board, for the most part, have defined God in very narrow terms and, um, and counterproductively. They have not defined God as pure love, which is what God is. You know, my book, Love by the Light, originally was called Affirming God, because that's the whole point of the work I've been doing, um, which is to provide evidence that affirms the existence of God and the 
the existence of an afterlife, which to me is fundamental. We That's the starting place. It's the basis for all social ideology. You know, right now, social institutions are in crisis, all of them, not just religion, but all of them, governments, um, education, everything is in crisis because we've had a complete, a complete breakdown of ideology. I mean, civilizations, societies, they come together around, uh, you know, a shared set of beliefs, convictions, perceptions of reality. Uh, they seek reality along the lines of agreed upon interpretations and definitions, which is what Confucius was saying early on, which kind of gave rise to Buddhism. I mean, Confucius, Confucius was saying, first, you have to get right in your perceptions of reality, of the nature of things, so that you can get right in your knowledge, <clears throat> so that you can get right in your action. Um, but it all stems from, first of all, being right in your perception, your comprehension of things. So, uh, you know, for me, we, you know, we have only one reason to be here, and that's to 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 love one another, which is what the great uh, avatars, mystics, sages, and saints have said. Um, we should love our enemies as we love ourselves, and we should do unto others as we want them to do unto us, the golden rule. It was never about the golden calf for the, for the sages and saints. It was about the golden rule. Um, so uh, we're living in very troubled times, probably uh, most troubled that I can think of uh, throughout recorded history. I mean, I know we've had our crisis points like World War II and Civil War and, uh, you know, human history is written in human blood, to be sure. But when you look at all the threats that we're facing right now, people are crying for help. They're, they're yearning for something that can fill the God-shaped hole. They're hoping... Uh, to find something they can believe in, something they can trust, something that has enduring integrity. Um, they're not looking to be sold a bill of goods anymore because they've had enough of that. Uh, yes, that's for sure. You know, Is it surprising it, how people are suddenly waking up to that? The fact yeah. that <laughs> it can't happen soon enough. Yes. You know? And the thing is, we have, we, as I said before, we, we've got a five alarm fire going on here, you know, um, uh, all hands on deck, um, uh, full court press um, to right the ship before it sinks. Uh, I mean, iceberg got ahead. Um, and I personally believe the only way we're going to right the ship is by connecting with God, uh, not on the basis of faith. Uh, we're fortunate uh, because science gives us now a body of evidence that is credible uh, upon which to predicate our uh, knowledge that God is real and that uh, consciousness survives bodily death. You know, you mentioned the International Association for Near-Death Studies. Recently, their president, the current president, Dr. Jan Holden, reached out uh, with an invitation uh, to contribute um, a uh, piece to the Journal of Near-Death Studies, which I wrote recently. And it was a reaction to her uh, commentary about, it was really a question. And the question was, should IANS uh, evolve beyond its current position of neutrality into a post-materialist point of view, meaning we're transcending materialism? Uh, to, to put that in common English, uh, what she was asking is, should IANS embrace uh, the thesis, the hypothesis, that uh, consciousness survives bodily death? Well, of course, Why not? Well, of course, well, because IANS has, for since it was founded, has been oriented around scientific objectivity. Obviously, the hypothesis, does consciousness survive death, cannot be proven using the scientific method to the complete satisfaction of science. Whose fault is that? Isn't that the fault of materialist science? Yes. Okay. Mater 
yes, materialism has brought us to the place we are at currently, which is not very healthy. Um, which is profoundly unhealthy. You are being much too kind, my dear. Yes, yes. Which is, yeah. which is because you are a profoundly kind individual. But I don't, uh, with respect, I think you are in a wonderful position right now. The question that they asked you is one which you have the authority to answer, and you can answer it in the strong affirmative. Yes, I and should transcend materialist science. Materialist science does not have the foresight or the brilliance or, frankly, the common sense to transcend a... Um, but they, the, the notion of materialism makes no sense at all anymore. They cannot do it on their own. So IANS should have the vision to do it now. Yes. Well, yes, that's exactly what I said in my response. I love you. Thank you. Yes, okay. you're, you're reading. Pardon me, pardon me, for, but pardon you see, me for saying that. I, but, I was know. saying this from the very beginning. I conceived uh, IANS in 1974 when I... I organized Raymond's first talk on NDEs um, at Augusta College, uh, and it was standing room only. The Performing Arts Center was packed. And I received a download from Spirit during his talk. Uh, don't get those too often, but with Raymond's talk came this whole vision for the association, and I, I, I conceived it um, based on the... A uh, strong conviction that we had irrefutable and controvertible evidence from not just near death experiences, but from a couple of dozen other phenomena. Of that, course. That yeah. consciousness exists beyond the body and is, is not an epiphenomenon of the brain. Um, nevertheless, I, you know, I, I was trained in the scientific method. I respect science and its methodology even though it has shortcomings. And yes, the materialist model is flawed. It is the product of flawed thinking. And it did rob um, soci social ideologies of their soul. So we really did become godless. And, you know... Um, but, they, but they also... Godless, you are so kind, my dear. They... Did you say stupid? That word, did it pass your lips? They became well, scientific, in fact. Well, you know, I understand where they're coming from, and I don't wish to be too harsh because I, I get I, I get their approach. I understand their orientation. I can be a bridge between science, let's just say, you know, hard science, physics, and spirituality, let's just say. Um, Is there a bridge? Is there a way to bridge that? Yeah, there is a way to bridge that. Of course there is. I mean, the problem with science in relation to STEs is that they've been dismissive. Um, they've been reductionistic. They, they do not take into account the full range of phenomenology. For, the, for example, the near-death experience. Of course you can say that some of the uh, reported phenomenology can be attributed to temporal lobe seizure or mm -hmm. cerebral mm -hmm. anoxia, you know. Of course, some of that can be of course. Uh, uh, posited as a as a valid explanation. But then there's a whole bunch of other stuff beyond that, yep. which cannot be accounted. Totally for. agreed. It falls under into the category of the unexplainable. But when you add enough of the unexplainables together across a wide range of phenomena, yep. you come up with a very strong empirical basis to develop seven statements, which is what I did when I right. formed Eternia. So in my response uh, to Jan Holden, to Dr. Holden, I said, I, I never was neutral in my orientation, and I'm the founder of this organization. I kind of left it in 1985 when I realized that they were pretty much wed to that neutrality position and they did not want to go beyond it. And they were still at that time focused only on the NDE. And I wanted to, you know, reach out and kind of uh, encompass all STEs. And I wanted to take the firm empirical 
position that we had evidential uh, reason to conclude that materialism is a flawed, erroneous paradigm and needs to be abandoned. Because what yeah. comes with yeah. what comes with materialism? Every man for himself. I mean, it's a full worship of of egocentrism. This lifetime mm -hmm. is all you have. This is all there is, and there's nothing else. So get while the getting's good. So what? That's what we have <laughs> in this world. Today. We have a get while the getting's good world, short sighted, that can't see oh. beyond, you know, the day or maybe the moment, and it there is no concern about what comes after. My belief has always been, and I've said this thousands of times, you know, the purpose of life is to optimize your life review on the other side. Now, it is true that there is no judgment. God, being of light, does not judge in the life review. So being of light only loves, gives perfect, pure love. No matter how much evil, uh, how much one did that was unloving, mm -hmm. everybody is received the same way. But as I understand, I haven't had... Uh, a, a voyage to the other side uh, yet. Um, I can only uh, draw from the experience of thousands who have. I've read most of the books. I've interviewed hundreds. Uh, as you say, I've met a lot of the pioneers and um, been fortunate to uh, be inspired by their work. Um, so I mean, I'm like, I kind of put this cosmology together in the seven statements, and it's logically coherent. And that's why I'm doing what I do with attorney to try to get the seven statements uh, uh, accepted as the new social ideology. Because if we don't get on the same page from which we can derive the same values, the same ethics, the same morals, uh, not based on, you know, faith in dogma, but based on Def empirically defensible observations about the true nature of reality, we, we don't have a hope. Uh, uh, we're going to become victims of the Tower of Babel, you know, 8 billion people speaking 8 billion languages. So my feeling is, uh, with the seven statements, that <clears throat> it's enough to fashion a highly advanced civilization, and we need to get on with the business of co-creating an ideal future for Earth and all its inhabitants while we still have time. We're running out of time from what I can see. So the life review, back to that for a moment, the being of light just looks on with love. Now, when you encounter this love, everybody who comes back says, they all say the same thing. They have no words. It's ineffable, their experience. The love is indescribable. They don't have the vocabulary for it. They know one thing. They want to stay there. They don't want to leave it. That to them is perfection, euphoria, bliss, nirvana, heaven, whatever word one wants, wants to use. But they're like, I don't ever want to leave this place. However, unless your pure, perfect love, such as the being of light is, such as God is, such as Jesus is, you can't stay there because you don't match the signature vibration or frequency. So in order to reunite with God, to reintegrate with the source creator from which all things come and to which all things return eventually, one has to match the vibration. One can only do that by being uh, Christ-like, which is what the founding fathers said, you know, Benjamin Franklin, uh, Thomas Jefferson, when they formed America, in, in, in his 13 virtues, Ben Franklin said, uh, you know, one of the 13 virtues was emulate Christ, meaning, you know, it's not that you believe in Christ or accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's that Christ is this ultimate exemplar, the ultimate spiritual role model. And if you look back at his teachings, he kept trying to say, except that you be like me, you cannot know the kingdom of heaven. Pick up my yoke and walk in my steps. The things I do, you can do, and greater. If you had the faith of a mustard seed, you could move a mountain. So, you know, <laughs> for me, it's pretty simple. 
for life review, to optimize one life's review, one needs to be pure, perfect love as best one can be inside of a body and in the midst of a three-dimensional illusion. Um, one has to be Christ-like, meaning free of ego. If there's a Satan, it's ego. Because ego says, me, me, me. And uh, to thee and to thee and to thee, but never to me. You know, ego is, I'm going to get mine and the hell with everybody else. When you're out of ego, you say, oh, we're all one. There's no duality. There's no separatism. We're all one. And what I do to my brother or sister, I do to myself. So that, in a nutshell, is where we need to move as a species and quickly. So I, in my book, uh, Love by the Light, I call for a global spiritual revolution or renaissance or reformation around these principles. Because I don't really think we have a snowball's chance in hell of getting through this mess we're in until we fill that God-shaped hole with none other than God. And when we fill it with the best way to, to do that is to emulate God. And and to me, it makes perfect sense if you look at all the the scriptures and you and you do, and you interpret scriptures in light of that insight or that point of view, you realize the best way to form communion with God and the best way to honor God isn't to build these great temples, you know, and monuments. Um it's to give love to everything, not just human beings, but animals, trees, the fish in the sea, the the earth. Um, all things are extensions of God. And that which you do unto the least of me, uh, to, to the least of thee, you do unto me. And so, you know, God is saying very simply, if you want to know heaven, then emulate me. Come from unconditional love no judgment and no ego and that's how christ that's what how christ did that's what he demonstrated on the cross when he said forgive them for they know not what they do you know they were coming from very limited myopic perspectives and so christ said what he did and he won his place at the right hand of god and we all can um but not until the we problem is Getting from the real problem is getting from where people are now to there. I agree with everything you're saying. I think it's beautiful, and that's why I haven't said anything. But going back to Ions, they asked you such a golden question. Yes. And the answer is yes, Ions. Yes. Consciousness is what you've got to focus on. Yes. Now, 1918 was more than 100 years ago. 1918 was the year that Max Planck won the, won the Nobel Prize. He won the Nobel Prize in physics as the father of quantum mechanics. Do you know what he said? What? He said consciousness is behind it all. Yes. And nobody listened to him. Yes. That was the year they should have abandoned materialism. Well, you bring up a great point, Roberta. I mean, you know, the great physicists, David Bohm, uh, Einstein, Planck, they started their work pretty much as either agnostics or atheists. And it was because but this they... This isn't about God. This is about consciousness. Correct. Because consciousness is God. Correct. We get behind the notion all the gods yes. were created to fill yes. the God-shaped hole. But the God-shaped hole gets filled with consciousness. Correct. And, 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 and the, the, please let me just say this. And that, that was exactly the conclusion, excuse me, the conclusion they all arrived at, that consciousness was fundamental. To yes, reality. But, he, but you see, he was the, 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 the scientist in 1918. That's more than 100 years ago now. Yes, yes. He had the moment... And he said consciousness is fundamental. Yes. And nobody listened to him. Well, this is So he had true. the opportunity. And for you to be the one to say, look, it's time to listen to Max Planck. Guess what? He was the core scientist. Well, I think 
IANs would probably respond more favorably to my point of view if my book became a bestseller and I became a well-known. Um, but they asked you for the question. They asked and, you, and I, yes, can't you and give I did. me that and, and answer? It, yes, and I was very grateful for that. And it was a wonderful golden opportunity. And I believe, believe me, I, I took full advantage of it in my reply. I'll send you a copy of it. Um, I think the journal is coming out in two or three months. Uh, and there are going to be others who are asked to comment to who probably don't share my point of view, but but you're, what you're saying is so important about the early physicists because when they look deeply into uh, quanta to subatomic reality, that's where they made the connection uh, between spirit, the unseen, and the seen, between um, uh, consciousness and matter. That's when torsion physics emerge, which I think is the area of physics that has the greatest potential. Uh, to you know they had to go to the Discovery Institute, which also is working. Uh, unfortunately, they're, they're, however, they're working on it from a Christian perspective. All their scientists are Christians. But now they're discovering this, you know, the source of and how, how uh, life developed they can do science too. A lot of people can do science if they get away from materialism. Materialism is the core deficit in yes. all of science. Well, you know, this this nexus between matter and consciousness is the missing link that Einstein was looking for to uh, to join <clears throat> general general relativity with quantum mechanics. But and, matter, in fact, does not exist. Get rid of matter and you solve it all. Well, it does not exist. You are 99 point and then put seven nines percent empty space. Matter yeah. is nothing. It does not right. exist. Yes, this is the three dimensional illusion uh, along with time and space. It's all it's only energy. Energy is all that exists. Yes. And consciousness and this, is energy. What a, what a great construct it is. What a marvelous, magnificent invention creator uh, put before us as a proving ground for the spirit. Uh, it, you yes, know, it's, exactly. It's a, that's that's what life is. said, my dear. Look, look that's, at that's how beautifully what, That's what life that. is. It's a proving ground for the spirit. And that's why I say, if you really, it's not complicated. It's very simple. It's you want so to know simple. your purpose? Love one another. Optimize your life review. Raise your God quotient to 100% as Jesus did. Emulate Jesus like Ben Franklin advised. That's all there is to it. My book elaborates on all of this. And, you know, I started all of this as a young child because I, I, I was always very sensitive to human suffering and pain, and the suffering of anything, including animals. And I said, there's got to be a better way. This, this is unnecessary. So my prayers... Uh, always revolved around, show me a way to address this, because I know we can do better. We can do a lot better as a species if we get the flawed thinking out of the picture. Get the flawed thinking out of the picture, because so many people are off on those tangents. Yes. They are, they are, they are distracted by so many shiny objects yeah. that, are, that are just yeah. not even real. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The golden calf is the shiny object, and you yes. need to get beyond it. You know, John Lennon uh, wrote a song where he, one of the lyrics in the song, I think it's the ballad of John and Yoko, he said, last night the wife said, oh boy, when you're dead, you don't take nothing with you but your soul. Think, you know, which is the, the name of Pascal's book, think, um, exclamation point, think. So, I mean, hospice was a, the dying patient. They were great teachers, as Kubler-Ross often pointed out. I was so fortunate to know her and to have her as an early mentor yeah. uh, because she saw it all. She she knew it. She didn't equivocate. She was one who stood on the stage and said, of course, there's life after death. We have an erroneous perception of death. If we really knew what it was, we wouldn't fear it, and we would live our lives much differently. It's sad to see people... Uh, facing terminal illness who do not have their spiritual uh, house in order because they go through the dark night of the soul. They go through this mental meltdown and 
uh, it's very hard to pull them out of it because they don't have the um, the foundational support. And for me, it's so simple. Look, if you don't want to take my word for it or read the, my book and take the book's word for it, go out and have your own experience. I point out like two dozen different method, methods that people can safely involve and get involved with that will bring about their own epiphany to make God real for them. Me, Buddha said it pretty well. Just go look at a lotus flower or any flower and study it. And God will reveal. God will become uh, obvious. You know, God cre God and creation, your know, creator and creator are not equal. But you can begin to know creator by comprehending creation. Creation is magnificent. It's elegant. I mean, how, the fact that we're having this conversation, we can think these profound thoughts, uh, that we can interact over this technology. I mean, this is amazing. Where does all this come from? Yes, it's so beautiful. So, so yeah, so it's very simple. It's not complicated. That's the whole point. We've got to demystify God. We have to demystify enlightenment. There's nothing uh, terribly onerous about it. And frankly, people are going to suffer self-inflicted wounds until they get it right, um, right in their perception, right in their knowledge, right in their action. they got to fill the God-shaped void, the God-shaped hole, with none other than God, which is none other than love. My God for a Day, I, I end the book with a recommendation to do God for a Day exercises. I could call it Love for a Day, but same thing. But my three, I, I don't talk about it too much because you do it anonymously and someplace where nobody knows you. You don't want to, you don't want acknowledgement. You don't want recognition. You don't want reciprocity. You don't give your real name. You know, you don't want to be identified because otherwise it sort of, um, you know, sort of t tilts the machine. You know, <laughs> the idea is to <laughs> just do it with humility and with anonymity, and uh, because you're being in service to God, in service to love. Only, right. And love, pure love, wants nothing. I mean, I, my favorite expression is, uh, want little, need less, and love more. So my highest highs were my God for a day exercises. You can't get higher than that because you start to climb into that rarefied air where you encounter God, because the minute you try to bring God's love through you with purity of intention, oh my gosh, the seas part. I mean, literally, they do. Um, you can uh, do. You can work miracles. I think it's really the basis for all healing. In fact, you know the 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 stories I've read about some of the great healers say so they just have to get out of the way, let go, and let God. Yes. It's doing yeah. the healing. It's God's love. Je Jesus uh, always said, you believe that I can do this? And when the when the person he was healing said yes, then he said, you know, you are healed. Yeah. I mean, that's that's how it how it was done. Oh, my dear, we've come to the end of our time, but we'll do this again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this it always goes so quickly. No, thank you so much for being here. I always so much enjoyed talking with you. Oh, John's websites are affirminggod.com and attorneya.org. And um, how are things going with Eternia? I, are you doing things Eternia there? Eternia is fine. It's there as a placeholder because it's never been properly funded. It hasn't really been funded at all. So I keep it out there as a prayer. Um, I describe it in all of its program components on the website. And I describe what I've just dis discussed on the website, the whole theory for social change. Um and I wait for a benefactor to come up and say, hey, you know, I love what you're saying here. I resonate with it. Let's get to work, you know, in a real way. So we do what we can. We're minimally operational. Uh, and who knows? IANS may um, take my response to uh, Dr. Holden's commentary to heart, and they may uh, adopt a post-materialist point of view. And get to where I was at in 1974 uh, when I tried very much to lead them in that direction because I I basically said, guys, this stuff is powerful. It can not only change human nature, 
It can change the nature of social, political, and economic systems. What are we waiting for? Let's go. Let's, Let's go. Charge the hill. So. Well, please, please consider yourself hugged, my dear. And once, once again, my beloved friends, we've come to the end of our time. And this has been Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes. I'm so happy you could be with us today. Please never forget that you are a powerful, eternal being. You never began. You never will end. And when you get that fact, and it is a fact, it changes everything in your life for the better. Next week, we're going to talk with Carl Unegbu for the first time. I hope that's the right way to pronounce his name. I have never talked with him, but he's a lawyer, a journalist, and a comedian. And now there's an unusual combination. He probably beats me because I'm just a lawyer, a writer, and an afterlife and gospels expert. I think he sounds more interesting than I do. He's written an enjoyable book called Comedy Goes to Court, When People Stop Laughing and Start Fighting. I, I've just looked at the table of contents, and it's very, very interesting. I'll have read it by next week. It's all about what happens when the laughing stops and, you know, you go to court. I can't wait for this conversation, so please be sure to join us next week. And this week, our guest has been John R. Audette, who has been with us for the fifth time. As, as you can hear, John not only is a lifelong scholar of spiritually transformative experiences, which we call STEs, but he's also a very intense guy who's really thought about a lot of this stuff. He's known just about everybody in this field, and he's done a lot of not just thinking, but also interacting, and he knew just about everybody. I mean, Eben Alexander, Edgar Mitchell, who walked on the moon, and he he's written a book which is very good. I, I loved his book. It's called Loved by the Light, True Stories of Divine Intervention and Providence. It's available on Amazon, and I will have him back again because we haven't finished talking about this stuff. And as you know, our great friend Craig Hogan is the president of Seek Reality Online, which he has put together there more information about life and death and the afterlife than exists anywhere else. What, like it or not, your life really is eternal. So it's time to start learning about it. You will, you have never felt alive the way you're going to feel alive after you have joined that website and spent a few months learning what you can learn there. So it's time to learn from my dear, beautiful friend and your friend too, Dr. R. Craig Hogan. He's the worldwide ultimate expert on all things afterlife. And we're starting to do the same thing with Jesus' genuine teachings. After all, he did not start the, the religion that bears his name and is now dying because it he never started that religion. And the dogmas of Christianity are not his truths. They're nobody's truths but the Roman Emperor Constantine. Teachingsbyjesus.com is your single resource on earth for all the beautiful divine truths that are brought to us in perfect love by the greatest teacher of them all, Master Jesus. Jesus asked us to start a website with, for his truths now it exists. We don't have the time to give to it that we need to. But we, when, when it is time for us to do that, Jesus will help us to find that time and that money. Meanwhile, it exists, it's there, and it's for you. So come and learn from Jesus what he actually taught. The genuine teachings of Jesus can at last truly come alive for us all. And that's about all the time we have. So if you want to talk about any of my books or if you want to talk about anything at all, you can always contact me through the green contact block on robertagrimes.com. I answer every email, but I need your correct email address. That's the one, one problem that sometimes happens. I write a long email and then it bounces. So don't make me sad. Make sure I have your correct email address. And all of the more than 550 past episodes of Seek Reality are available wherever audio podcasts can be found. You can see the new video episodes each week on Roku, Fire Stick, YouTube, and elsewhere. And meanwhile, this has been Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes. Please enjoy and make the most of this coming week in our one reality, always knowing that you are a powerful, eternal being. And most of all, in this entire universe, you are infinitely, eternally, and perfectly loved. You've been listening to Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes. Roberta blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. 
Join us every week as we explore what the afterlife evidence and modern science combine to tell us is true about the one reality we all share. Knowing the truth changes everything. 